the term yet, it has a German term, the precarious, the precarious, the precarious. These are people that actually seemingly are middle class, but in fact they're like this, they're almost below the water. That is to say, they're working, but if they lose once or twice their monthly paycheck, they lose everything, because they can't pay for their house, they can't pay for their car, they're going to be evicted, etc. And actually this is happening right now. As the housing bubble is bursting, people are getting evicted. And so we have a sort of lower middle class, which is in a threshold of actually falling into poverty, in effect establishing a new kind of American proletariat. This was, of course, uh, the main concern. Uh, so on the one hand, the propaganda machine, on the other hand, the sort of deteriorating uh, middle class. So we then mapped out what the possible scenarios of this middle class crisis could take. I mean, I won't dwell on this. There is you know, the real estate bubble, which is currently bursting as we speak. Um, the, the, um, the economists predicted that up to 8% of American homeowners would be kicked out of their houses next year, by next year. Oil crisis, obviously. Dollar crash, consumer debt. So of course we're purposefully pessimistic here, but the point is also to by this exaggeration, demonstrates something that in fact is already there. I mean, it's just exaggerated in order to make it visible. So then the question we ask ourselves is, out of the ashes of economic disaster, uh, will emerge a new underclass eager to consume the rhetoric of fascist populism, thriving on anti-intellectualism, sectarianism, conquest abroad and repression at home, how to save the values of the enlightenment in the face of this? This is what we set out to, uh, to work on. <coughs> In fact, the, this new underclass, the new proletariat, has a spatial location. It's not everywhere, but it's particularly in a series of middle ring suburbs that are substantial. These are suburbs that were built between the 30s and the 60s, and that have basically uh, uh, been deteriorating and have not been invested in substantially since that time. Uh, of course, that the building of those suburbs was also a conscious project. Uh, but what happened is that the initial, the foundational dream, which really was Arcadia, the, you know, the seeding degree, the liberation through nature, also education, uh, you know, uh, becoming good citizens by living in nature, which led to an early project when it was first built of garden cities and parkways and degrees, etc. This has just been purged. On the same site has been filled with parking lots. Uh, the building stock has deteriorated. You know, the parks along the parkways have, have been uh, cut away for a new commercial enterprise, and the highways have expanded. Um, so basically, this is a, a territory that has been purged of its foundational dream, and nothing has been given instead. There has been no alternative project or another vision that could inspire it. So hence uh, our project. We inspired ourselves on the WPA administration, which is a, the, 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 the uh, work of uh, Roosevelt, the federal government of Roosevelt after the 1929 stock crash. And basically Roosevelt started building the American welfare state. So for us it is also a question, can we contribute to making government and the welfare state an attractive proposition again in the American context? We have to know that we've been going through 30 years of relentless propaganda against government to the point of where you now say government in the US, people also think evil. Uh, but this is in a sense uh, what we wanted to get away from and make that sexy again, the notion of government. So we looked at the WPA and then proposed our own white paper for the federal government, a sort of draft for how to intervene in these uh, impoverished middle ring suburbs. And that is the actual content of the team issue of volume. By the way, it's, I'm happy to say that it's been sold out and it's the most sold issue of volume ever. So um, uh, I'm, of course, very proud about that. Some of the people that contributed to this issue and very important to uh, actors and project are actually sitting in the room here, some of the students in MIT. The book itself is 17 uh, propositions. Uh, seven of them are organizational, so we may try to aestheticize and, and make beautiful and attractive the notion of the public institution. So we design institutions. And then there is a series of more architectural and urban design uh, propositions. I'll just run through them, uh, and then uh, that's it. Uh, to build a, uh, to start an agency for new territorial infrastructures. So we designed a logo, designed a board for the agency. An agency for uh, the building of transfer stations on the intersection of uh, railroads, existing or new, and uh, existing highways. With templates for the design of transfer stations, finding locations in New Jersey where those would fit. Uh, an agency for education or re-education. Uh, an agency for communal housing, which is based on the premise that luxury becomes affordable when shared. Uh, 
an agency for escapist and hope programs. So I mean, the reality would be this terrible that the only way to be able to imagine an alternative is actually to be able to go to the cinema or to engage in some kind of virtual reality from time to time, which allows you to survive the, uh, you know, the desert. Uh, three partnerships, as I say, uh, partnerships between government and the major corporations, where the visionary uh, uh, corporations are called up to their task of, you know, helping rebuild the country. Neo agrarianism. Uh, constellations and figures that to say, once we start building these territorial infrastructures, we might as well do them in such a scale that they effectively help uh, creating a way of understanding the suburbs. <coughs> Assemblage of monuments, which, as you know, is actually very important in the in this book. A certain anthropomorphism in the monuments. So there's a level of cognition and recognizability. A level of empathy between the onlooker and the object is, uh, is established. Collective construction. So, I mean, in, in the age of a huge unemployment, we can build this together. The result of this is that the projects become really low-tech. There's no high-tech uh, apparatus, uh, no technology celebration involved here. Company towns, a great contribution of American urbanism in the 19th century, where in fact we would inspire ourselves on, on existing company towns, which just simply densified them and make them such they could fit with the theory of the transfer stations, so we built on top of transfer stations. Uh, platforms. Or basically, one can uh, develop a, a, sort of a public space apparatus which is such that it can allow for any kind of appropriation, but in an inviting manner. Panoramas. By distancing yourself from the actual territory, you get to understand it better. Separate and reconnect. So, I mean, again, in sort of endless continuity of the suburbs, uh, one you try to understand where the actual districts are, establish them more clearly, and then reconnect them. Architecturalization of infrastructures and formalizing the informal. And so here I want to show one project which actually deals with many of uh, those issues mentioned above. Uh, formalizing the informal has to do with the fact that after the crisis, uh, in a sense, the informal mechanisms uh, that are absolutely important and essentially uh, American today are the ones that will actually have survived the best since the formal apparatuses have uh, basically collapsed. <coughs> Uh, so these could become a driver for the reinvention of, uh, of, of the American suburb. Formalizing the problem. So this is a project by uh, James Chen, uh, one of the transfer stations in the, in the city right there, uh, one of the transfer stations in, uh, in New Jersey. It consists of three elements, uh, a tarmac, uh, a proletarian shopping center, and a Chinatown. As you can see, the tarmac is completely programmed and densified for all possible uses, including parking, but certainly more than that. Um, and you see the proletarian shopping center. What it does is basically eliminate the in-between layer of the big box uh, supermarket and have trains with goods come right into the neighborhood where you just take your stuff out of the train. You can see the tarmac under that. This is a section of Chinatown. You inside the voluntary shopping center. You can see there's a, you know, you pick up your stuff in the in the wagon and you back out. So okay, this is a sort of overview of that. I mean, there's much more to say, and uh, I'm glad that you uh, pointed the book. There's theory in the book. <laughs> um, then there's a. This is a small project, which is a, for the, the redefinition of a small a town center in Belgium. The competition already got second place. This is a town as it exists. You know, city hall, church, and a whole apparatus of public programs which are completely invisible, inaccessible. Uh, and so where our project is, in fact, simply this, this uh, hinge, which by, by organizing it efficiently, we actually succeed in restructuring a sort of public terrain that uh, runs through the entire uh, town. And, you know, it's like a chain of public uh, programs. You can see the projects on the left here. It's, um, it's a great really assemblage of monuments. It's not, as the other entries did, one big thing, but it's a lot of three fairly small ones, and I'll show two of them. And in fact, what they do is between them, very carefully, you know, 
flanks as our, our open spaces, interstitial spaces are being defined. 